What's up? I am David Long. Thanks for joining us today. I got a bunch of guys from the Integral community with me today talking about race and racism and the ways that racism has manifested in the Integral community and what we should do about it. So today with us, we have Blake Abramowitz, Josh Simon, David Hartwell Jr. And joining later is going to be Bruce Alderman. Round one. So I'm going to start us off and I'm going to just tell you what my experience of racism in the integral community is. And then we're going to pass it around and talk about it some more. So I've been in the integral community for a little over 10 years. And I would say it was it was a good while before I ever saw anything racist, especially explicitly racist, happen in our community. I think it's been more recently that we've seen a lot of alt-right people on the Internet infiltrating all kinds of dark web type groups. And I don't think it's just the integral group. I think they're going into all kinds of groups that they think might be sympathetic, like the Jordan Peterson groups and Sam Harris groups, basically any groups that they think that might be non-conventional. They want to get in there and try to influence the dialogue. They want to sneak in there. And even if it's not like explicitly saying something racist, what I see a lot of is them just like starting stuff, getting the people in the groups to argue with themselves about whether racism should even be debated in the group. And so what I've seen happen a lot is it's not even about talking points or any of this kind of like what they what they end up doing is they end up using ideas about democracy and free speech and things like this against us as a strategy to try and normalize racism as a conversation, like whether it should even be debated and stuff like this. And basically, there's a lot of people who come from a more democratic and liberal perspective. And they're like, you know what, we can win this argument, we should be able to debate this stuff, we should be able to talk about this stuff. And a lot of the times the racist person has like backed out of the conversation quietly and let the members of the group argue with each other. Mm. I see this happen a lot. Like an agitator thing, like they're trying to just stir up provocateur. Provocative. Yeah. 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 They start shit in the groups between the people and then make them fight with each other. So it's like not only do they cause conflict within the group, but they also are doing this kind of covert thing to make racism a topic of debate in the group, whether they're in it or not. And so the cause of this is that racism itself seems normalized. That's a pretty big problem. So we've seen it that happen a lot on Integral Global. And when you point this stuff out to Corey, Corey Devos, the guy who moderates that group. Mm hmm. What I've seen is that he'll say that racism is not compatible with integral theory or with integral thinking, but he won't kick anybody out for racist comments. In fact, I even heard him tell a, a Nazi who quoted Hitler to not be so obvious. That was in the thread that led to my exit. I Same with me. So you guys remember explicitly what I'm talking about when he said that. I don't think he meant it like he was like explicitly trying to tell this person to be more covert with his racism as a Nazi, giving the benefit of the doubt. He might have just been sarcastically being like, you're being so obvious with this. But still, at the end of the day, he said, this is a bad look. It is a really bad look. It's a really bad look for our whole community, especially when it's completely incompatible with our value system. So. It seems to me that when these people who come into our groups from these explicitly racist groups like propertarians, they are a group that is like advocating for violence and for civil war. And these people will explicitly say things about how some people are less than human and stuff like that in an integral group, in an integral space. Mm -hmm. The other reason I wanted to have Bruce Alderman on here was because not that long ago, he had that Earthies group that was supposed to start out as like a fun, integral meme group where we joke around and maybe say things things that are uh, like the, the idea there was like, feel free to fully be a dick. And people who don't know the backstory to this, like Wilbur back in the day in a famous episode compared himself to Wyatt Earp and said basically that when you're like the top gunslinger that every punk with a pea shooter wants to come and take a shot. And in this talk, he said that there was one critic who kept on being critical of the fact that he said simply too much. And he said to that person, I say, you can simply suck my dick. <laughs> Now, this actually upset a lot of people in our community because they thought that was a bad look for someone like Wilbur to say. That's an ego. Who claims to have transcended ego and stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I personally am more upset by the fact that he spent his whole time only dealing with his negative critics and like not spending any time dealing with his good critics 
and I'm more upset by the fact that he's not really dealing with his critics than I am that he told people to suck his dick. But that's the origin of this website and like kind of where they're where they're going with it. And it eventually got taken over by some of the worst actors in our community. There was lots of sexist comments in there. There was terrible, terrible sexist comments in there. Really bad racist stuff started to emerge. And then basically all of the reasonable good people slowly exited this community until it just became like the worst actors. What I found out later after I started to try to cancel some of these racists in our communities is that they actually have their own version of an integral group. And for a while they were telling everybody to go to Erpies like it was the best space. And mm. I forget the name of the, which integral group it is, but let's yeah, not, there's- Let's not publicize them or give them uh, any marketing for free. Okay, good call, good call. <laughs> But yeah, so they're infiltrating our space. We're trying to. And there are definitely people in our community who are sympathetic to this stuff. And they have a plan. They have methods to be able to infiltrate our spaces. They have an approach to be able to get us to argue with each other. They're organized and they're trying to get stuff done. And we mm -hmm. need to be organized against them and not fall into their traps. Yeah, that's basically my opening comment about my experience of the racism that I've seen in Integral. What do you think, Josh? What's your experience like? I've seen pretty much the same things you have seen. They're, you know, the bad actors coming in and doing exactly what you described. I think for me, the surprise was not from the bad actors coming in from the alt-right or anything like that, because that's just what happens nowadays on mass media. I was surprised by the people who were members of the community often expressing things that were borderline or sometimes over the line, anti-Semitic or racist in nature. One of the biggest examples I can think of in general, like a general large example, is the example of double standards. So there will be people that will, for instance, speak out against the actions of Israel as a nation. And they have varying degrees about whether they can differentiate between the government Israel and the people Israel. Yeah. Um, and and then, don't get me wrong, there are some very valid criticisms that you can make of that country. And if you want to talk about it integrally uh, or spiral dynamics, you could talk about how it's a blue-centered country and that they take their mythology literally and, and there's problems with that. And there's, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that, there is no question. But what they do is they apply this standard to Israel and then give all the other countries a pass. So when Israel goes in there and roughs up some Palestinians, rightfully, wrongfully, I mean, mostly wrongfully, okay, they, they complain about that, but then they conveniently neglect the daily murder and killing of Syria of its own citizens. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the, the number of Syrians bombed and blown up every day is way more than the number of Palestinians roughed up or killed every single day in Israel. And like I said, you could do this in a fair way. You could do this where you don't take either of these countries or these people as, as innocents in any stretch. But you got to compare them apples to apples and really look at that and, and talk about stages and such. And they, there's just no attempt to do that. There's just people there that just want to apply this double standard of no matter what, Israel's wrong. And I can't help but to think that it, it goes back to some kind of shadow or something where there's just, you know, when you boil it down, uh, Israel's a Jewish country and, and they have a problem with that. And that's pretty much at their subconscious level, pretty much what's going on. You know? and, and I'm just theorizing about that. Obviously, I can't know what's in their subconscious, but I've seen a lot of that happen. Right, yeah, this inability to make a distinction mm -hmm. between like Zionism or something and like Jews as people, right? right? So it's like, like I've definitely seen like, yeah, memes and stuff shared by integralists yeah. about like that are anti Jewish and not just anti Israel. Like they right. definitely have crossed over the line in sharing these cartoon faces of the enemy type of stuff where like you have Jews looking like rats and stuff like that and like yeah. blaming them for the world's problems and shit yeah. like that. Terrible stuff. Yeah, and those are the members, man. Those are not, I mean, yes, the far right people that come in there and they do it too, but th those are like some of the members, okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's my experience. What's up, David? What's your experience like, man? Well, for me, I'm not too worried about Facebook just because I know people are going to say wild stuff on Facebook. This is how Facebook works. But my problem was more with a lot of the shadow racism that was in the actual interval works, like Don Beck's work. In The Crucible, he talks about how in South Africa, they shouldn't transition power to more sharing between the Africans and the Africana. He makes the point in the book that what they should concentrate on is growing the economy and not redistributing the wealth already created. And that with the growth of the economy, you know, Africans will be included in that. But the thing of it is, is that there's no guarantee the economy is going to grow that fast. And after 20 years, we've seen that it didn't. So another thing about the book, he kind of centered the- Yeah, that sounds people. like some trickle-down economics type stuff. Well, it is. I mean, it's 1990 he's writing this. And he and he is a Republican. He supported Trump. And so- What? Back yeah, he was, Trump. yeah, he he liked Trump. Well, every time every post I saw in 2016 was liking Trump until uh, Rex Tillerson got fired. Then he turned against him after Rex Tillerson got fired. Wow. Yeah. So when I first started Integral, I read Claire Graves when I first started. 
And so I heard about it from the theory from uh, Leo Gara on YouTube. And I was so blown away. I was like, wow, I immediately went and got Claire Graves' book. And I loved Claire Graves' book because he talked about in that book how a lot of the people in prison, many of them were red mean because of different life circumstances that happened to them. And I was like, wow, this guy's really kind of trying to understand why people fall behind sometimes. And I know it was written in like 1950, but I was like, this is this is at least something I could work with here. But then I got more to Don Beck's work. And in the Crucible, he talked a lot about how a lot of the Africans were centered around red and blue. And a lot of the more left-wing black people were in red and blue. And the people he put in orange were people that were complying and working with the Afrikaner government. So the guy he rated, he only rated like two or three people in South Africa orange. And one of them was Prince Budalese. Prince Budalese. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Budalese. And he spoke so highly of Prince Budalese in the Crucible, I decided to look him up myself. Well, it turns out he was in charge of a thing called the Nkatha Freedom Party. And during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they found out they were actually getting money and kickbacks from the Afrikaners to kill ANC people. And so the guy that he loved so much is a collaborator. You know, that's one of the main people he said was really great in his book. And his framing of Mandela I didn't like because he talked a lot about how Mandela went and put on the Springboks jersey in 95. And how when he was out of prison, he talked a lot about people coming together and forgiving everybody. But I don't feel like he talked enough about the progression because Nelson Mandela went to prison for trying to blow up a government building. He started in K, which is the militant wing of the ANC. And by not framing his whole life together, it made it seem like his compliance is what made him yellow. And so if you look at a lot of the modern day South African theorists, a lot of them have problems with Mandela because they felt like he was too conciliatory and you didn't try to redistribute enough of the wealth. Because this idea that the economy is just going to grow inf infinitely and exponentially isn't right, and we've proven it's not right in the last 20 years. Like, the economy's not going to double or triple. Like, it's basically the size it is. If we don't redistribute the wealth, nothing will happen. And so I went to the Don Beck conference two or three years ago, and he mentioned that in his former life, he couldn't stop the Civil War, but he could come back now and stop conflicts. And I was like, what? what? Yeah, so I didn't know what he was talking about at first. He, he could come back now and stop who? Conflicts. Okay. Conflicts, conflicts, conflicts. And so he started talking about his PhD thesis. So I was like, okay, so I looked up his PhD thesis. It's on Amazon as an ebook. It's called uh, Conflict and Compromise. And in the book, he says that we could compromise on slavery. We could have stopped the Civil War. But he doesn't explicitly say what compromise could have happened that would make slavery less bad and okay to continue. And just the idea of like, yeah, black folks can still stay slaves, basically, as long as those white folks don't fight. Maybe it would have been like a halfway, like, maybe it would have been like a rental service. Yeah, it's like a rental, <laughs> like a rental. Like you get slave sick days or something like that, slave vacation days, like. <laughs> but, maybe, uh, maybe he would have liked Reconstruction where they were basically still slaves anyway, but just paid slaves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah but it does seem like slavery is kind of binary. You, you, you know, you either, either is or, it or you don't. Yeah. You know. So I actually made a video on this. And so if you look at my page, Black Leadership Analysis, I have a summary of conflict and compromise, and then I have my rebuttal to it. And I go through why slavery couldn't be compromised, and because they actually did try to compromise. The compromise of 18, I want to say 1857, I don't remember the date, but they were trying to say, we'll demarcate these slaves as free and these states as slaves. But the thing is, if a slave went to the North and his master wanted him back, they still have to extradite that slave back to the South. So essentially, slavery was around the entire nation. And so I go through each compromise, because they did three different compromises before the Civil War, trying to avert the Civil War. And I go through all three compromises and explain why none of them work. And then I give just my rebuttal. In the book, he actually says that Black people shouldn't be consulted on civil rights issues because we can't see it objectively. Hmm. Wow. And so when you have theorists like this who founded the theory, you can expect that there are going to be white nationals that come in and try to join up and feel like they're going to be accepted. And that's why I have such a problem with certain things Don Beck said. I have a problem with Jordan Peterson because he implies with the whole IQ debate that black people had a lower IQ because of some genetic defect. And that's actually already gone through by numerous theorists and they've proven that not to be the case. Yeah, IQ, that's not that's not the case. Yeah. We have that good IQ data on that. The guy Flynn, who's like famous for the Flynn effect, like he found that as black people were given more options that actually their IQ raised faster than anyone as they were given more education and opportunities. Yeah, so like, exactly. J Jared Diamond's work too, he's another. Yeah, uh, exactly. Same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, I understand why white nationalists feel they can come into our spaces because we placate too many of these ideas in our own theorists without unpacking them. And so that's why I started Black Leadership Analysis. I necessarily don't consider myself part of the Interpol community. I consider myself somebody who's coming up with a separate ego development theory. 
and I'm usually mainly black and underprivileged theorists to create the meta theory. And you know, when I first started my site, a lot of people tried to tell me it was reverse racist because I concentrate on black theorists. And it wasn't that. What I'm trying to counter is the fact that in all the integral stuff I read, I never heard anyone black mentioned. You know, except for maybe Nelson Mandela and like one or two other people. So I wanted to go and do a deep dive into the theories around blackness, social justice, and civil rights that are already in my community and build a meta theory from that. And then that can be compared to Spiral Dynamics and you see which one you think is better. Would and not so, that theory fit into uh, integral theory somehow? It no. will eventually because I'm using integral theory as my base, but I'm also using e ethnic identity development, which is an ego development theory made by black people about learning about your blackness and growing into your blackness. I'm going to include a lot of different meta theories into this too. So I consider myself outside the integral community because I saw too much racism going on and not enough people really trying to unpack it and really moving towards anti-racism. And I want to talk about the concept of anti-racism too. So I hear a lot of people quoting a guy named John McWhorter and he is countering a man named Abraham Kendi. So Kendi's theory is that there's actually three schools of thought on race. There's racist, which believes that black people are genetically inferior. There's assimilationist that believes black people are inferior due to some deficiency in culture. And the goal is for black people to act and be more like white people. And then there's anti-racism, which is the belief that there is no discrepancy and ability between blacks and whites. And the deficits you see and the disparity you see is solely because of policy. And so McWhorter, the few articles I've read of him, he really misconstrues what Kendi is saying. And I really want people to really go back and actually read Kendi and not just McWhorter. That's one thing I see in integral sites a lot a lot of confirmation bias because McWhorter has more of the right wing views. He's seen as somebody who's closer to integral than somebody like an Ibrahim Kendi, but they can't even understand their own bias in that they want these right wing ideas to be correct. So that's why they like McWhorter more. And it should tell you something since John McWhorter doesn't have a large black following. So most black people aren't even listening to him. So if the only black guy that you think is integral or you think should be listened to doesn't have a black following, that proves right there he's not integral. Because if you were truly integral, you could put forth new ideas to people in ways they could receive them. And if you can't do that, then you're automatically first tier. And to me, I didn't see enough in the integral community to make me want to dive deeper into it. I really see myself as someone outside of it, kind of doing my own thing. I'm not one to sit on a message board and just argue back and forth with people who don't want to change their views either. That's some second round stuff there, right? Where we talk about what we can do about this, I think. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's interesting, David. I think there's a lot that we could probably unpack in what you just said. Man, I'm very interested to dig into some of that stuff deeper, but maybe I'll bracket some of my questions about some of that stuff for the later round where we open yeah. up the discussion more. It's a great start. Thanks, bud. Pass to you, Blake. What's your experience, man? I, I find it astonishing that Beck would have said that Black people should not participate in the discussion around civil rights because they are too emotional. I mean, that's horrifying if true, and I, I haven't read Beck, so I don't know his trip, but I, uh, that is horrifying. This was written in 1964. Oh, okay. Okay. So well, he, was little... it, he, he wrote that in opposition to the civil rights movement. That was not a mistake okay. that he was writing like that about that. Okay. Subject. He well, was that writing... actually makes more sense now that he wrote that in the early 60s. It kind of clicks a little bit better in my brain. Those probably weren't terribly rare views to find at that moment, right? But he still said it though. Oh yeah, no, totally. Totally. Like David Long said, I have a lot of thoughts about everything that everyone has said so far, but I think I'll just keep to the format. Y'all are very interesting people. <laughs> this could be a very rich and complex conversation. My experience in integral communities is really limited, actually. I made friends with my yoga teacher in LA, who is a real serious heavyweight intellectual, Julian Walker, and he introduced me to a lot of stuff, Ken Wilber and a lot of other writers that I'm into now, like Steven Pinker, all kinds of stuff. He's been a real great guide for me. So I feel like he's really kind of my channel to integral theory. And then I read a lot of Ken Wilber, like Brief History of Everything and Sex, Ecology, Spirituality and Grace and Grit and a couple other ones and beautiful stuff. I mean, like just really opened my mind in a lot of ways. When I came across David Long, that was really useful because he helped me to confirm some of the doubts I had about Ken Wilber that Julian Walker had instilled in me, which have to do with his unsupported idealism. He just sort of takes it on faith that there's the four quadrants and he'll talk all about those, but then he'll say that the page that the four quadrants are written on, well, that's spirit with a capital S and he doesn't really unpack how he knows that or what the epistemology is of that exactly. So I went through kind of some development in the way that I thought about Wilbur and got involved on Integral Global under the guidance of Julian Walker. And I think that's where I ran into you, David, or maybe Julian just shared videos of you with me. 
And I just got into some discussions on there, as you do. I thought there were some really intelligent people on there, like Joseph Dillard and Bruce and David. And I've had quite a run of tearing it up on Facebook and hashing out the debate. And, you know, so it was fun and interesting. And then one day after COVID-19 hit, I was arguing with some people who seemed really committed to ungrounded conspiracy theories about the virus. And I was just like, show me the evidence. Why do you think this? I'm happy to listen and just going back and forth demanding evidence and it got kind of heated and I was like being a bit of a dick and so were they and it was just all in good fun. And then, I can't remember the guy's name now, but somewhere on this long kind of complicated thread, which involved several posts, so several threads of this long running conversation, I just happened across a post where, well it was three comments actually, in the thread under one of these posts, where this conspiracy theory guy mentioned Adolf Hitler and he said, well it's like Hitler said. And then he quoted Hitler, and I can't remember the quote exactly, but it was something fairly typical of Hitler. Maybe not the most egregious thing Hitler ever said, but, you know, there it was. And under that, there was a little cartoon of a Jew in Hasidic dress walking around in New York City. It wasn't the most virulently anti-Semitic image. You know, he didn't have, like, the rat face or anything, but it definitely, it was like, okay, this is a cartoon about a Jew in New York City, and it, it was something about how it's all he has to do is walk outside and know that he owns the world, and he doesn't even have to do anything. And then under that, there was some other comment about Jewish banking conspiracy, and why aren't we allowed to talk about that? And so it wasn't one of those comments that sort of raised my alarm. It was the three of them together, and so I just kind of casually said, can you tell me more about what's underlining these comments? comments, this cartoon, this rather approving Hitler quote. And he said, sure, man. And then he just went on a paragraphs long classic anti-Semitic rant about the termites burrowing into the foundation and the banking conspiracy that goes back centuries and Hollywood and on and on and how civilized people are no longer permitted to question Jewish power. And I was like, okay. So I tagged Corey, the administrator in the uh, thread. And I said, this is not okay. You know, you can't have this kind of rhetoric just popping up like whack-a-mole randomly in a community like this. This is beyond the pale. This is straight up Nazism. I mean, literally Hitlerism with the quote and everything. I was like, what, what the hell is going on here? And then on that very thread, Corey sort of very mildly sort of reined in this person whose name I forget. And he said, you know, you know, yeah, you might want to just like take this elsewhere. And I've warned you about this before. And this is a little beyond the pale. But then he said to me, but you know, Blake, this is integral and we look at all levels, all quadrants. And so we pride ourselves on being willing to talk about anything whatsoever. And, you know, this person has a particular worldview and let's talk about it. And at that point I left the group. In integral, I said on some other thread, there's a huge confusion between the difference between organizing information and validating information, organizing mm -hmm. worldviews and validating worldviews. Integral organizes worldviews. It'll, it'll place them in the quadrants or in the stages, etc. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's saying that all views are valid. I mean, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to say that Nazism and racism are trash and that they're invalid worldviews. You don't have to try to say, well, you know, I'm integral because I can validate all views. That's BS. That's green BS, honestly. I, I mean, it's just, yeah. that's not what it is. So when, when you get someone that's saying, well, you know, we're integral, we can talk about anything, it's like, yeah, you can talk about it, but there's a fine line between talking. We can, we're talking about Nazism right now, but we're not validating it, right? Right, right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's the thing. And I mean, just got to say, as a left-leaning Jewish scientist, I'm wondering where the hell all my checks are because these people are not paying. <laughs> I should be getting several of them. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say that it's kind of a theme in confusion around integral in general that people think that just because you include different perspectives from different parts of the spiral or something like that, that, that automatically makes you integral or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you include this and you include this, so you're integral. It's like that video I did about Ken Wilber, Jordan Peterson, and Sam Harris, right, where Wilber is saying, oh, well, look, Peterson has blue ideas, orange ideas, and green ideas, therefore he's integral. It's like, mm -hmm. well, that's not how you measure integral. Like, mm -hmm. combining together different perspectives does not therefore make a person integral yeah and yeah so same thing with this including thing this idea of transcend and include all perspectives well green includes all perspectives and transcends all perspectives like we need to integrate diversity with discernment that's just, what we do mm -hmm. yeah yeah. yeah yeah so just to finish up i left the group and well i just want to say for context i am not very like woke i used to be and i've kind of moved toward the center in, in my way of thinking 
I am a critic of cancel culture. I, I think it's a terrible thing, and I speak out about it. I'm not a fan of this whole thing, at least in part, because I was kicked out of my meditation community for talking about views that this very hardline progressive community was not okay with. But these were perfectly mainstream views. That's the difference. This gets into maybe another question for later in the talk, but I think that as a culture, educated, civilized, contemporary people have agreed on certain things. And outside of those parameters, there's this whole territory of reasonable, acceptable debate and discussion. And then there are ideas that are beyond the pale, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk to these people or that they shouldn't be addressed. It doesn't mean that. And so, like we'll probably talk about later, I think that there are ways, if it's really important to Corey Davos to include Hitlerists and neo-Nazis and white ethno-nationalists in a discussion, then there are ways that he could do that that would be less distressing. I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, well, half Jewish on my dad's side, and then a wasp on my mother's side. I grew up in Israel. I grew up around Holocaust survivors. Uh, it's not amusing to me to be bombarded with that just randomly. I'm happy to address it in the right context with the right framing, but we can, we can talk more about that later. But I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that this is coming from a person who is highly critical of cancel culture. I think that this is a, a misstep. And I'm saying that it's crazy what's being allowed on that platform <laughs> into real global. It's, it, it's off the, off the rails. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good, that's a good first round. You get an idea of where most of us are coming from in our perspectives. Round two. So most of us are, and I'm going to include David in this, even though he says that he doesn't consider himself to be a member of the integral community per se. I consider him to be a member of the integral community. I <laughs> consider too. him to be, to be a leader in this community. And at very least, I would say he's you know one of the leaders and one of the uh, most important voices in my group and the kind of integral 2.0 that I would like to see get going. But yeah, so we all have groups. We're all members of these groups. We're all in these groups in general of, you know, the integral community. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to have this talk in the first place is because I think that we need to come up with some strategies. We need to come up with some plans about how to deal with this stuff. And we need to talk about what would maybe work and what hasn't worked and things like that that we can do to try and clean up some of the mess in our community and try to have good standards and try to deal with this stuff reasonably. Because like, like Blake, I too am not a fan of cancel culture. But on the other hand, I also don't think that we need to be debating racism in, in, in an integral space, right? So like when I say I'm not a fan of cancel culture, like I think there should be a road to redemption, right? So it's like to me, like you can have been a racist in the past. And if you denounce those ideas and say that you're sorry and that you want to move forward and that you've learned the wrongness of your past ways and like apologize, like. I'm going to want to welcome you back into the community. Like, I'm not going to be like forever upset at a person for some bad ideas that they used to hold. But at the same time, I don't think that we need to be discussing ideas that are debunked and, and antiquated in our integral spaces, things that we should all already agree are wrong. And like, it's, and, and I would say it's not, it's, I would say the same thing about like fundamentalist religious stuff too. It's like, if a person came into one of our integral groups and tried to talk about like how we all need to accept Jesus or we're going to hell, I would be like, look, you don't belong in this group. You know, maybe when you get a little bit more mature and you can, you know, deconstruct these beliefs, we'd be glad to have you. But for right now, you're not there yet. Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about like, where do you draw the line and like, why and how and like, how do you say, okay, at this point, like you did this, you're out. And to me, it's like, when, as soon as it becomes explicit, like, I don't have a problem with a person sharing data. Like we've done that. We talked about IQ and stuff like that in this talk already. Like, that's fine. You could talk about that. It depends. Like, I don't think it's about discussing it. That's a problem. I think like, what's your point? Like, what are you trying to imply with this data? Are you trying to imply with this data that one race is superior to another? Okay, well, that's a racist statement. You're advocating for racism. You're out. And what I've seen in our community is that there's a lot of people, like leaders in, who run these groups, people who are moderators of these groups, they have this philosophy of like, hands off. Like, we're all adults here. We can, you know, let you guys handle it. Like, don't run to mommy and daddy and like cry like tattletales whenever things don't go your way. But on the other hand, there does need to be standards. There do need to be times at which someone needs to step in because what we've seen in groups like Integral Global and in the ERPI page is that when there aren't top-down standards, when there aren't leaders who make sure that the quality of the group is held together, that the reasonable people leave. That's how uh, the adults handle it is they're like, well, fuck it. I'm out of this. I'm gone then. If this is what it's going to be about, I then I'm what, why am yeah. I here with these maniacs. And it's terrible that a group like Integral, who actually should be trying to reach out to include more women, 
more people of color and more people of other races to include their perspectives, that they would allow for this kind of talk to be had in these spaces where these people should be made to feel comfortable and at home and welcome. And like you just got, you're welcome home. And instead of that, we're going to debate racism. I think it should be like, okay, look, this person said this, here's the comment. It's explicitly racist. They got kicked out of the group. If you want to argue with them about it, send them a personal message. I think we could do a little better than that. I mean, okay. Uh, well, let me pass it to you then, Simon. <laughs> Josh, Simon, <laughs> tell uh, yeah. us what's up. Well, I mean, first, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, I guess I'll start by saying that one of the, one of the issues, as I see it, is the integral community has a bad habit of uh, trying to diagnose everybody, and uh, you know, oh, I'm integral and you're blue or you're you know red, and and you know, I hate crap. that shit. I, I hate that too. I mean, it's crap and. The, the, the problem with that is that you just can't do that because it's impossible to do. You don't know somebody's own subjectivity. Only they well, know. But the very theory stipulates that no one is ever all in one. That's right. right. Or the other. You're I, always people moving. are a mess. They have all these different lines at these different stages and at different times. And, you know, and sometimes they're stressed and sometimes they're feeling good and they can right. go. I mean, people Anybody who tries to reduce people to a stage of development is, is a bad practitioner who doesn't understand stages of development. And yet they do. And yet they do. And, 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 and not only do they, but it's, it's become like the focus of the entire group. And, and I think that, that that's a terrible focus. I think what we should be doing is focusing not on the, that subjective quadrant all the way in the upper left. I think we should be focusing on the interrelational quadrants, and, uh, both uh, interior and exterior. I, I think we should be talking about what, what our systems are doing and what, what our relationships are doing, not what somebody is. I don't really care. Um, so having said that, um, the worst way you could uh, address address a racist or anybody who's doing something you don't like is to just basically call them a prick and tell them you hate them, right? That's not going to, that's never going to help. It's never going to do anything. Um, and, you mean and, for them? For it's them, never well, change yeah, their it mind. might be cathartic. It might be cathartic. Yeah, I won't change their mind. <laughs> <laughs> it might feel good for you for a minute. Um, but the the, uh, the idea is if you start saying okay well you know this list of things is good and this list of things is bad and if you talk about these bad things you're out uh, there's always going to be disagreement over that there's never going to be a universal list who gets to decide the list who you know I mean I think we're talking things. about we're talking about like again I'm saying I don't think it should be based on like that you shared that you talked about IQ or something like that but if it, if if we find out that you're explicitly advocating the idea for the idea that some people are more human or like uh, superior or, or something like this, like the, like I, I'm not saying like I want to make topics off off limits. Well, I'm that saying that is a topic, right? That is a topic. So okay, and we all agree on that topic, but uh, maybe that there would have to be like other topics as for other conditions upon which you'd be thrown out for for other things. You know, like if you talk about uh, pedophilia, right? You know, and there's another one, right? But there, there's going to be sure. there's going to be uh, there's going to be subject matter that's going to start getting more and more and more gray, where some people are going to say, yeah, chuck them, get them out. And some people are going to say, eh, you know, it's, it's gray. You know, so obviously pedophilia and racism are not gray, but there, there are going to be things that are gray. So I, I would like to point to a system that I have found worked very well, and I've kind of been in it and working on it for like 20 years. Is There's a, there's a community called Slashdot. I don't know if you know what Slashdot is, but it's at slashdot.org. If you want to put that link in your comments, that'd be pretty cool. Um, but they have what's called meta moderation and moderation system, where uh, the people who are reading the posts get to moderate. So if you post something and other people moderate it as good, then you get moderator points and you get like four or five. And then you get to give a point to all the posts that you think are, are well-written and well-constructed, or maybe you're just an asshole and you just give posts to tarot. But, the, but overall the system works where people write a post and that you post give, winds you up points with a to hot girls. Um, it's almost all nerdy guys, I'm sure. So it doesn't really matter at that point. But I mean, so your, your post winds up with a score like negative one to five. And then what you can do when you're on slash dot reading is you can set your reading level. So I can say, I'm going to read at a level four. And if I read at a level four, I'm not going to see any of the Nazi bullshit. It's always there. It's always there, but I'm not going to see it because everyone's modding it down. And that, that level four reading is usually pretty good, respectable posts. And then I could read at a negative one and I can, it's like the Jerry Springer show, but worse, right? You know, I could, I could read a negative one and see all the Nazi bullshit. But I, I mean, personally, I read it about a four. Um, and I think that the, the good thing about that is that, it overall kind of averages out and, and it's a automated system uh, that, that gives out these moderator points. It's checked by a human, but ultimately it's run by people who are giving each other points. So you can have picture like a Facebook group. I mean, I Facebook can't do this yet, but picture a Facebook group for integral where these Nazi people are simply modded down, which means that not really too many people are going to respond to them. So, I mean, at, at that point, you're, 
you're no longer putting fuel on that fire and it's no fun for them. So they go away, right? And, they're, and certainly their tactics, like you were describing, David, where they organize and they get in, they try to sow dissent, it won't work because they're just going to get modded down. Anyway, I, 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 I've been on Slashdot for over 20 years, and I, I love that system because I never have to deal with garbage there for that reason. Well, that's a good way for you or for the individual to personally filter out the stuff that they want. And yeah, I mean, within that context, with that system, that would work and be useful. I don't know what Facebook group leaders are going to do in the meantime <laughs> or how, like, I mean, imagine if it was, eventually I would like to get to the point where we have integral movement and we have real life groups, face-to-face -face groups, local groups. And so it might get to the point where we, we might actually have to like legit draw lines and kick people out and do that stuff. If you have a membership for a, a Facebook group or a website or some system that we create where you have like an overall, and, and on Slashdot, they call it karma. You have a karma score. Yeah, if your karma score is below a certain amount, then guess what? You don't get to join these live talks or anything. You just, you got to have a karma above a certain amount in order to be able to do any, to do that kind of thing. So there you go. So digital social respect or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's good. Yeah, what do you so, think, David? Well, for me, like I said, I, I'm doing my own thing now because I, I saw too much stuff in the interval group I didn't like and didn't really trust. So I, I do my own thing in my own group. And for me, I'm working on building a meta theory from the social justice theories of different black leaders. So I'm taking all their individual theories together and trying to mesh them together and see how they work and see how they grew out of one another. And I feel like by doing that, I'm going to be able to attract more, more black people, more people of color, because they're going to see themselves reflected in the group. And so I'm very careful about not sharing things like uh, Sam Harris and Georgia Peterson, because I think those guys are on the borderline of being Islamophobic and things like that. I think Sam Harris has said some Islamophobic things in the past. And so I don't really share those guys in my group. And I feel like instead of attacking them directly to debunk them, I actually do better by talking about people like Adrian Bond, who did his IQ work in the 1930s to prove that Black people didn't have genetically less IQ and things like that. So I'll debunk them in a roundabout way by talking about people like Adrian Bond and, and other people like him. I try to bring in as many new people as I can. I try to make a space where you feel free to ask questions and talk about your life as it is. You don't have to worry about, if I say, you know, my cousin's going to jail, is everybody going to think I'm like some stereotypical hood guy? In my group, you can talk about that there and nobody's going to make fun of you or say anything wild to you. You know what I mean? And if they did, we would moderate them and kick them out. Because I'm not going to go to Corey and ask him to moderate the way I would moderate. Because I understand that he's a different person and what bothers him isn't going to bother me. So for me, it's about building your own community up. Now at some future day, we might be able to mesh the two if there's people in the integral community interested in that. I'm, I question how interested most of the integral community is in really building a more inclusive community. I question that sometimes. I think a lot of people there want it to be mainly a right wing thing. That's why I have a hard time self-identifying as integral. You know, I, I consider myself a separate theorist. I think it's sad that, uh, that the right wing influence has gotten to the point where you feel necessary to do that. I mean, yeah, I, th I think it's sad too, man. Like I am really upset that someone like you wouldn't feel comfortable in our community or in our spaces or that you would feel like this. I mean, I feel like it's a major failing of our spaces and our leaders that when people of color or when ladies come into our group that they're not made to feel welcome or that they feel even discriminated against. That shit is crazy to me. It, sh it should not be like that. So when I wrote, I did my videos on conflict and compromise. I actually uh, did the videos and posted them on YouTube. And I sent it to Don Beck the, a week before I posted it on Facebook because I wanted him to see what I had got from the book and see if he had a rebuttal. And he just wrote me back and just said that, oh, it was, that was uh, very professionally done. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> and so I posted it online a couple of times and I didn't get any engagement. So I kind of just figured nobody cared. So he might okay. as well have told you you were articulate. Yeah. So I, I mean, honestly, I just, after that, I really stopped posting a lot of interval spaces. I'll come to Beck's grades. Spiral Dynamics every now and again, I'll post a little something and talk to some people. But other than that, I, I, don't, I haven't posted in another integral group in, in a long time. I figure people know me well enough they can come find me. You know, I do a lot of history, writing about history now. So I'm doing a series on black militancy now. And I'm actually going through all the black militants and how they progressed and how they grew their theories, you know, to go from really blue all the way to green. Because people don't understand there's different forms of black militancy too. One thing I felt like with Beck was when he talked about black people and black thoughts, he automatically, and he actually, in some of the work he actually says, if you still see things in race, then that's automatically red and blue. So like from somebody who like me, who's very proud of who he is, I didn't feel like, well, I'm automatically re relegated to blue then because I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a black man and that my thinking comes from a black perspective. And I'm very proud to say that I have a problem saying that. 
And so if you say, well, if you think that way, you're automatically in blue, then. And I've had people tell me that in interval spaces before. Like, tell me my level of, huh? There goes that diagnosis problem again. Yeah, yep. exactly. And I'm sitting here like, y'all don't even know, y'all could name two black leaders of what they thought and detail their theory. <laughs> You know, yeah, that's like, yeah, no really doubt. Read, like you got to read us like and we have great theorists. Yeah, you know what I mean? there's lots of good just, black and philosophers. It's not, and it's not just John McWhorter either, who doesn't back up a lot of the stats. He says he doesn't back them up. That's one of the things he doesn't like about Kendi, because in Kendi's book, he actually went through McWhorter and debunked a lot of the stuff he says. It shows how he doesn't have sightings for a lot of the stats he throws out. So that's why that's why McWhorter don't like Kendi. That's that's it right there. Seventy two point three percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but the great thing about Kendi, of all the people I read last year, Abraham Kendi's book, it, it was one of the best books I, I read all year. Stamp from the Beginning is the name of the book. It was one of the best, well-cited books I had ever read. And if you know how to listen to it and read it, you can see the ego development trajectory in the different theories he talks about. So it, it's a great book. I consider it an integral book. I don't care what anyone says. In your uh, in your mind, your thought, what what would yellow integral black thought look like? It would focus on material discrepancies. It wouldn't just be about everybody just saying they get along anymore. I mean, there would be a strong push for redistribution of wealth, but at the same time, there would also be a branch that could go out and reach out to a group like this and explain how things are and why we see things the way we see it, and also back that up with data and facts. One of the things I did a analysis on Shelby Steele. And Shelby Steele really was John McWhorter in 1990. And so Don Beck praises Shelby Steele to the max saying he's integral. So I go through all of his uh, Wall Street Journal. He writes for the Wall Street Journal and Harper. So I got all of his Wall Street Journal articles and all of his Harper's articles. And I go through and explain why I think he's in orange and not in interval. One of the things Shelby Steele does, he talks a lot about anecdotal evidence. He argues against affirmative action. And his reasoning for it is because he knows one black guy who made it to the chair of the English department of one university. And he just says that, oh, he didn't need uh, affirmative action or anything. And he was just the best guy. And I was like, well, racism's over then, right? So yeah, right? it's all good. We got one English professor <laughs> in his chair. So we're good. We can go home now. Like, I'm just like, that's obviously not a good analysis. So I go through uh, in more detail, point by point, things he, that he does wrong. Like one thing I hate about Shelby Steele, he'll, he'll say that racism isn't a serious problem. And then in the next article, he talked about how his son was called an Oreo and how much it hurt him. And then he also talks about how he had to quit a 10-year job at the University of Utah because he was getting so much harassment because he's married to a white woman. And so he had to take a lower paying job in California because they could go to the grocery store and not get harassed and stuff. So he himself is a victim of racism. But if someone else black talks about what they're going through, he tries to poo-poo them. And that's one of the things I don't really respect about Shelby Still. And I feel like if Don Beck really read him in depth, he would have saw that, or maybe he wouldn't have saw that. And the thing about that, that 1964 article, he talked about it in the 2017 interval conference a lot. And he also has it on audiobook. So that means somebody recently uploaded that to Amazon for buying. And I sent it to him a week earlier for him to let me know that, you know, he doesn't really think this anymore and he's changed and he's rebutted it and he didn't write me back. People he was always nice to me. All our interactions that I actually talked to, him, I met him once, he was really nice, but I still can't get behind what he said in the 64 paper, and I can't get behind what he said in the Crucible. I mean, I, I think he really needed more people of color around him. Sorry. Uh, well, people of color can't be objective in this conversation, so they have to be left out. You know? Yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, for me, I just, after a while in the integral community, I just didn't feel, you know, welcome, and I, I posted every now and again in there just to, you know, kind of say hi and see what people have to say about something, but I mostly post in, like, uh, black groups, like African-American history groups and stuff like that now, so... Well, for the record, brother, I find your work very valuable, and I'm very glad that you're in our community. Thanks. You're one of yeah. the few I, I deal with, and one of the few I still post in, so. Before we wrap up, for sure, I want to get you to give us, like, a short list of Black philosophers and thinkers that you think every integralist should check out. Yeah. But, but while we're still in this round, I would really like to know what you would like integral leaders to do about racism in their groups. Like, what do you think would be a good solution that you would like to see done about this? For me to be a part of it, it has to be firmly committed to anti-racism. Like, there, there can't be any of this, oh, well, you know, he's a Nazi, but, you know, he's cool. Like, none of that. Like, we have to be firmly committed to inclusion, seriously looking at various Black thinkers, even ones that with ideas we don't agree with. And I think yep. that's very, very important. And I really feel like I shouldn't have been the first person to do an integral study on Dr. King. Like, I actually looked for that online, and I was like, I'm sure someone's already done that. You know what I mean? And I looked and looked and looked and there was nothing. I was like, no one's looked into King from an integral perspective yet. 
And, you know, like, man, that's like the story of integral, right? Is like we all come into a, into this thing and we're like, oh, well, someone has to have done this, right? And then we're like, no, I guess it's going to be me. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm really big on self reliance. You know, that's one thing that many theorists talk about in the black community, like Garvey. You know, don't always be begging to be let into somewhere. Start your own thing. And I felt like I just had to go ahead and start my own thing. And I hope that one day it all reconciles. I'll probably be way old and dead when it happens, but I think one day it will all reconcile. But I just don't see it happening anytime soon. You know, David, when I first came out with the integral emergentist revolutionary thing, like those were the main factors that I was focused on was the emergentism and the revolutionary movement. Because I feel like Wilbur, as a sort of out of touch, privileged white man, when someone asked him, like, why should we care about the problems in the world? He said, when you're in a dream at night and there are people starving, there's two ways you can help them. One is that you can feed them in the dream. And the second is that you can wake up and that will end their suffering immediately, right? So this is that Buddhist spiritual bypassing. Like there are real problems in the world and like integral ideas could help. And that's why a lot of us got involved in integral in the first place is because these ideas matter and they're helpful. And like we, we care about wanting to use them to help make a difference. So focusing on the, the more like revolutionary movement, like let's take action in the world to create a more just system and a just reality for everyone. Like I think we won't have peace and equality for all races until you have everyone's basic needs taken care of and equal opportunities given to everybody, you know, like stuff like that. But I've been thinking lately more about trying to rebrand the integral emergentist revolutionary movement more as like an integral 2.0. And I have like my list of differences between like old integral and new integral. And I was thinking like pretty recently, like, okay, this is going to have to get added to the list. Like this firm anti-racist stance that you're talking about is that like in Integral 2.0, we will not tolerate racism. Yeah. Um, and so I'm hoping that on the back end of this, you know, once you make these, ex these distinctions explicit and things like that, th then people like you could be like, well, I'm not really down with the Integral as it is, but Integral 2.0, that is like something that I can get on board with. And I'm hoping that people do that for all kinds of reasons, for the racist reason, for the rationality and emergentism reason, and to actually, because people want to have some kind of revolutionary movement, you know, like there's a lot of good reasons to want to upgrade and do things differently and do things better. So I hope to be able to talk about that more in depth soon. And I hope that it makes people of color and women, and I hope it makes more people feel included and like that they're cared about and that it's not going to be justified for people to, to talk bad about them in our spaces in a, in a blanket kind of racist or sexist kind of way it's not going to fly and i don't think it should fly exactly and i like how you have a lot of good informational integral that is no cost because there's a lot of people that need this info that don't have six seven hundred dollars a pop for a course I that's mean, another one of the things on the list is that it's got to be cost effective and available to people yeah i mean think about it. someone has 600 bucks kicking around for something like this they're already uh, upper middle class probably you know yep. people don't have 600 bucks kicking around for an internet course that's right um, yeah and that's you know, why we don't see more people of color in our community is because the way that it's set up, it like is almost set up as if like we think that people who are cognitively advanced are also economically advanced. And that's exactly. just not the case. That's just not the case. There's plenty of smart people who can't get a good job. I mean, it's just mind boggling. And I don't think me enough integralists understand that, like how much they're missing out on and how much perspective they're missing out on if they really want to have a new integral world emerging, you know? You gotta have everybody involved at every level. And I, and then like uh, community activism is very important. I'd like to see more integralists going out into community activism and trying to throw integral ideas into community activism. I mean, I shared one of my videos on the quadrants to uh, another guy who's in a social justice movement with me. And he was like, man, this quadrant thing is really good. This is really helpful. You know, like, you know, if you show it to people, they're like, wow, this could really help me. And I mean, yeah. and we have to make it to where we're talking, we're teaching quadrants well, yeah. talking about things specific to people's culture so they can relate to it. You know, yeah, this idea yes. that, it, yeah, you got to talk about something going on in that person's culture and then talk about the project and that gets them into it and makes them connect to it. This and is I why I think your work is so valuable, honestly, is because you can t talk about King and you can talk about um, topics that are relevant to people that people care about and you can reach audiences that other integralists just aren't even talking to and so we honestly we need people like you and we need people honestly like we need people like you to, to carry the banner too so hopefully we can get a, a you know like a version of integral like this that you can feel comfortable like flying that flag and you don't feel embarrassed about it or like negative association or something like this that's going to be important i think because you really do bring bring a lot to the table man and your work is super valuable Thanks. When I started Black Leadership Analysis, I was trying to find Ken Wilber videos that I felt like would be relevant. 
But every time he talked talk about race, you could tell he was like extremely right wing. He wasn't really inclusive. And I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. And that's why I didn't share a lot of Wilbur videos, even though I liked some of the stuff he says. So that's why I just made my own videos. And I just like, I was yeah. making my own and just do it that way. And um, so I just started making my own videos. And I have a course now that's free on YouTube. Um, and, you know, I, I give it to people. I did a talk for um, one of the DC Integrals. There's two DC Integral groups. There's one that's a meetup that's free. And then one that's like kind of ritzy and it, you have to pay a lot of money to go into it. So I gave a talk for the ritzier one that they pay a lot of money in it. And I did my talk. And I was like, man, that's one of the best talks we've ever had. And, and um, I was like, yeah, I try to give them one for free because everybody doesn't have $1,000 for a course. And one of the ladies was like, I guess everybody doesn't have $1,000 for a course. I, I just thought of that. Like she had no clue that there's people that don't have a G kicking around for internet courses. Like, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, like you don't have a thousand dollars just laying around, like for something you barely understand. Accessibility is huge because I mean, one of the problems I, as I see it is that a lot of the folks we have in the movement right now are very well degreed people, very intelligent people uh, who have lost not only touch with the fact that not everybody has a thousand dollars in their pocket, but also that not everybody can read and understand or listen to a video uh, that's that's done at a graduate school level. I mean, if you if you want to get to people on the streets, you've got to talk to them face to face in, in there in some way that's yeah. accessible to them you know so you know it, it, you also have to understand where they're at or, or aim where they're at if you're going to aim for blue or aim for red or aim, uh, because it's it's gonna go over their heads if we just keep looking gazing at our navels and, and pretending that we're all yeah. psychologists um it's not going to work um so I, I i agree i think you should take all that keep doing what you guys are doing and 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 gear it towards people who can understand things in very simplistic terms i mean the 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 whole virus thing that's going on right now, for example, I'll just give you one, one small example. One of the big messaging problems out there right now is that all the messages are geared towards caring for others and taking a third person perspective. But at, at Blue, you, you can't really do that. It's not that you're defective. It's just that that faculty hasn't come online yet. You can't do it. Like a, like a kindergartner can't do calculus. At Blue, you can't really think about what it is to be someone else. You know, at, that comes online at Orange. So you, you're, you're not going to get anywhere with these people by saying, care for others, go, you know, your mask doesn't protect you, it protects other people. What you have to say is your mask protects you because, and you can lay it out for them. I mean, you can lay out a case for when you wear a mask, the people around you don't get as sick. And when the people around you don't get as sick, you have a less chance of getting sick. But that is, it's, we're saying the same thing, but we're shifting right. perspective, right? To and them. you don't lose people in your family and stuff like this. Right, you're right? going to lose like, people in your family that you care about. I mean, you know, we're, we're just talking to these people completely incorrectly because they right. don't give a shit about other people and they're not going to. And it's not because they're defective. It's because they can't. So, you know, they I have, definitely have agree with your larger point here about accessibility. Like, I, I think we see this all the time is that these academic and really smart integralists get on here and then they just start doing this like, jazz terminology yeah. poetry stuff at you and it's just like who are you talking to like i'm an integralist and like i'm i'm knowledgeable and i understood most of what you said and the context and even i'm like struggling to keep up with you on this shit like who are you flexing on with this like are you trying to communicate right now or are you just trying to like show everybody how smart you are like that's the problem with like a lot of these a lot of these dudes a lot of these academics they really want to craft the words and get the poetry and get the terminology and seem like really smart and insightful and like do it in a way that's like jazzy and cool and it's like yeah like well they that's do it over so other academics can't pick them apart that's really what it's for but that's that's beside the point i mean when i talk to i and i've been an academic when i talk to people that are not academics and they're and they're lay persons i don't worry about whether another academic is going to tear apart what i say i know that you know they'll they'll tear apart a lot of my simplifications and oversimplifications but i'm making those oversimplifications for a reason so that way the information yeah. could be accessible. And, you know, you always have to kind of start out by telling people things without all the details. And then you add the details in later. You know, because yeah. you give them everything at once and you just vomit all over them. They're not going to get it. And, and yeah. it's, a, it's a slow spoon feeding kind of thing. So it's not, you don't vomit on them. So uh, that's, that's something that's lost on a lot of those academics. Yeah, yeah I think Dr. Right. Cross, Dr. Cross is a great example of making academia accessible. So Dr. Cross, he came up with this idea of ethnic identity development. As an ego development of how people grow into their blackness. And you start off in what we call pre-encounter. And in that you uh, internalize a lot of the messages sent around you in the world and you have lower self-esteem. And you try to avoid dealing with the fact that you're black. And then you have this encounter where you have to face the fact of you are different than other people, you're gonna be treated differently. And when that encounter happens, you go into immersion with uh, E 
and immersion with an I. So you emerge yourself into black culture and you have a lot of anti-whiteness at that stage. And then after a certain period of time, you emerge out of that as a full whole person. And then once you go through that, the next stage you can either be a monoculturalist, somebody who only sees themselves as African, a biculturalist, someone who sees themselves as African and American, and you can also be a multiculturalist where you have holds various different identities all at the same time and none are more important than others. Do you feel comfortable with each identity? And so what Dr. Cross would do, he would go and he would teach all his classes at the university. And then he would just go outside, basically like pitch a tent and teach anybody walking by on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And he would just teach them just, just like me and you were talking right now. And so you could be walking through on the sidewalk and hear uh, psychology lectures that most people are paying, you know, for several thousands of dollars to hear. And I think we all need to kind of copy that model. Because I think Dr. Cross gave us a great model on how you can actually, how you can actually bring this to people. And when black psychology was made, it was made for a lot of the same reason I do black leadership analysis. Psychology was based around this idea when they talked about black people, that there was just something wrong with black people. And the goal of psychology was to figure out what that something was. So this is like where King talks about like maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live the well-adjusted life. There are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. And stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so in, black, in psychology, it was just what was wrong. And there were different arguments on what was wrong, but no one came to the argument saying that there's actually nothing wrong with black people. And the fact that they're still here shows how resilient they are. So when Cross and Thomas started black psychology, it was started from the perspective of let's find out all the stuff that makes black people so resilient. And that's how they started all their theories. And I feel like I need to do that same thing in interval. And I think that at some point it will all come back together, but I think we need to make that stand at right now saying that we're going to separate we're going to build our own theories up. And then once we're done, we'll come back and see what, what happens when we come back. I think that's good. It sounds like you're talking about almost like a different line of development. Like It is. It uh, is a different line of development. It's, yeah. it's, it's the ability to hold identity. You know, because I think that a lot of people, when they talk about race, they think the goal is to be raceless. That just nobody sees race and no one cares about their ethnicity. I want to know people's ethnicity. I want to know how you as a white Southern man sees the world. And I want you to be able to explain to me that perspective without going into the racism. And I want right. to, be able to explain my perspective without hopefully saying anything that's anti-white because I want to move past that myself. And I'm not saying I'm totally past it. I probably I said tons of anti-white stuff over the years on my, on my channel because I can say what I want to say. But, you know, I'm still striving to make it inclusive for everybody. And I think that's a very important thing that Interrealists miss is that there is a way to hold all your different identities but still be inclusive and see yourself as part of a larger group. But that is a later stage of development. And you have to let people go through all of their stages to get to there. I don't see a lot of people in Interval talking about, talking about this like that, you know? And I, right. And yeah. It, it's, yeah. For me, what, what came to mind when you were talking about that earlier stages of development in black militant movements, I mean, I'm sure, well, it sounds like you know more about it than I do, but what came to mind was somebody that I have read a bit of and a bit about, which was Malcolm X. And he you know, was part of the Nation of Islam, which was obviously an explicitly anti-white group. And then he had this, you know, toward the end of his life, this amazing transformation where he came back from the Muslim world with a completely different idea. He traveled and he just realized, uh, no, that was, that was lower level thinking. And like, we're all one people. And, and, you know, he started talking like that and it like blew everybody's minds. I just wanted to uh, pick up on something David Hartful said uh, too about how he about how you encountered people in integral spaces who would tell you that your interest in your racial background made you less integral or something like that. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to echo what you said. Uh, I agree that that's not the case. Like so, so I'm English, Irish, Scottish on my mother's side, and I'm Polish and Russian Jew on my dad's. And there's a lot uh, that I'm kind of proud of in my ancestry. There's all kinds of stuff about the history of England and you know, the Jewish diaspora that it's not like I really take it on all that seriously, but it, I do feel a sense of pride and connection with that history. And I guess the, just the little point I wanted to add is I think, I think what sort of takes a thinker down a notch is when that racial or ethnic or ancestry 
becomes the paramount thing about them and about other people rather than one aspect of, of group identity. And then, okay, so, so I just wanted to say that, or, or one aspect of a, of a more sophisticated understanding of I identity, which includes universal human common identity, which includes the, the individual, unique, sacred identity of the individual and, and so forth. So that, and then, okay, so I just wanted to say in response to Josh's thing, I'm sorry, I took notes. So I didn't forget. <laughs> uh, I like that idea that you laid out, which is basically that, that point system. And I, I think that's, that would be cool. I, I think, like, I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, but I still just think uh, that it's simply an ugly thing to allow... Th th there, there are certain positions that are simply beyond debate. Beyond debate within particular communities yeah, who already exactly. have established agreements or whatever. Yeah, you could say that it's just not appropriate here, right? Uh, you know, you can, you can argue about all kinds of things that can get unbelievably controversial and painful and challenging and overwhelming, and there can be incredible amounts of disagreement about it, and we're still sort of in the civilized milieu, right? Uh, we're, 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 we're having broad agreement about certain fundamental principles or axioms that, uh, on which we're all standing together. So, you know, if someone approvingly quotes Adolf Hitler, it's like, I'm sorry, and then posts a Jewish cartoon underneath. Or if somebody says, well, you know, the Confederacy had it right because black people really aren't fit for citizenship. Or, or so, it, there are certain things, or women just really absolutely belong in the kitchen, period. And they should be restricted there by force of law. I mean, people hold these positions and they're... It's like if, if I were getting people together in a physical space for a meeting to hang out and someone articulated those views, if we were getting together for a book club or a discussion group or a group of friends, I would ask them to leave. Uh, I, it's, it's just, there's a limit. And so um, I do think it makes sense to talk to people who hold those views, but I think it should be framed differently. I mean, the idea that I had was like, if something comes up in a discussion group like that, then you say, look, we don't actually, you don't belong in this group if this is how you think. We, the people in this group agree on certain fundamental things. And then say, but listen, if you want to have a conversation with members of our group, then here's a time and a place, come prepared, and we will eviscerate you publicly in a, you know, in a video debate in this kind of format or something like sure. that. Um, and, and then we can't be accused of driving ideas underground or, or empowering them by making them seem cool because they're not, you know, allowed in the public space. And I think that's actually important. These ideas yeah. should be publicly destroyed over and over until they don't arise anymore. And then uh, we also don't have them popping up like fucking whack-a-mole in, right. in the just randomly in these uh, in these groups, whether they're online groups or physical groups. I mean, and I think it's the same with lots of these ideas, you know, like, uh, and I mean, like, honestly, I would like to get it to the point where it's like, okay, look, we dealt with that. Like, here's the artifact about it. If you want to go watch that, you can. But like, we've moved on from that. Like, yeah, totally. we, we did that. We dealt with that. Here it is. Catch yeah, these things are up. established. We're moving forward. They're, 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 yeah. It's, it's like saying, well, you want to you want to re-argue uh, the, the, the laws of thermodynamics. It's like, no, yeah. we're, we're moving forward on the basis of that understanding. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can't just keep. You, if someone comes in saying the world's flat, you don't have to re-explain why the world is round. That was done by um, uh, the Greeks. You know what I'm saying? Like Josh back there with the world behind him. He's like, this <laughs> yeah, world right? looks flat. I don't know. But I mean, you know, it's like serious scientists will get together with flat earthers and debate flat Earth because it's important. Because it's like you don't want more people to get confused and become flat earthers, and so you, so you want a a robust debate out there about flat Earth theory. So it's like right. that's good. And you don't want flat earthers standing up in the middle of the, you know, the, uh, the Academy of the Sciences or whatever, because they don't belong there. Right. So it's like you want to make some kind of a, a way for them to have their ideas processed without, like, uh, including that stuff. Yeah, but uh, it's very the... clear. It's like David Long and Friends is hosting a conversation with some Nazis because they, <laughs> because, uh, they popped up in our group. And this is how integral thinkers relate to this beyond the pale ideology something like that so i actually did that i have an interview with a guy named black rebel and he's a black confederate flag supporter so me and him actually debate <laughs> the confederate flag uh on this podcast i'll post it in david long again i posted it once but uh yeah i'll post, post it again it, yeah I'll post link it in again. the description as well yeah i'll send it you to guys you. if you're watching this right now 
make sure you check out David Hartsville's work. I'm going to make sure there's a link in the description for that. Check out a lot of his videos. He's talking about lots of cool stuff about integral thoughts related to black leaders and the history and stuff like that. Dude's super knowledgeable about history. And there are lots of like even rappers and stuff who want to like try and reclaim the Southern flag and stuff like that, right? Mm. Well, there was a uh, goodie mob back in the day. They wanted to, uh, they, and um, Little John did a video with the Confederate flag. But the idea behind it was that if black people started flying it, white people wouldn't want to fly it anymore. So it'd be like you assimilate it to like kill it off kind of thing, which didn't work. I mean, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was a good shot. You know, you gave a shot. Hey, we're, we're, we're right there with you. But, you know, I, I want to say like in my hometown, they actually have a generic Confederate statue in front of my courthouse. I did some research on this thing. So there's like 7,000 of these Confederate soldier statues made. And it's just a generic Confederate soldier. And they put it on the town squares deliberately to scare black people from not protesting for voting rights. That Confederate statue was still there and I went home a couple months ago and saw it there. I took a photo of it and I was just like, man, this thing is still here. And then the Albert Pike statue thing here in DC. So Albert Pike, he was a Confederate general and we had actually signed petitions to get that statue removed six, seven years ago. And then, you know, the guys just went and ripped it down. And I'm just kind of like, man, like, you know, it was, just, it was just wild to me, you know, just seeing it actually down and I was just like, I was kind of flipping out after I saw that, so. Mm. So it's a little bit off topic, but I would like to see us, people talk about, oh, the, the protests were peaceful. And like here in my, in my city, it's like, oh, our local cops are good. Like they came out and they were part of the protests and they were saying Black Lives Matter and all this, all, all this stuff. It's like, isn't that all great? It's like, not really, not if they're gonna keep doing that stuff. Yeah, and like, exactly. if they're gonna like do their job and like still nothing changes because we think that, oh, our cops are good cops. Like, I think that's a great strategy to not have to actually take any responsibility to change anything, right? Like I actually would like to see more strategic things like let's go and rip down all these statues. Like that's what I think these, these protests should be doing. I don't wanna see the peaceful protests because like back in, in King's day, right? When he was doing peaceful protests, like he was putting real pressure on people and places to make things happen like it wasn't like thing, maybe. it wasn't just that he was like we're gonna all get together and sing kumbaya in a public space no he had like a strategy and a plan and yeah it was peaceful protest but like it was peaceful protest towards an end putting pressure on something yeah like i feel tangible all right you guys i better jump off i got a, another call in a couple minutes here so i'm just gonna okay. reset but this was great thank you all so much and i hope to kind of reconnect and on the page about about everything Thanks. Thanks for hanging out, Blake, and contributing yeah, your course. perspective, brother. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate you having me, man. It's, like, really fun for me to be involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Josh, David Hartful, thank you guys, too, for your insights. Yeah. All right. Peace, buddy. Yeah. Peace. Round three. I guess Bruce is, like, not going to end up making it to this yeah. talk. That's too bad, because I was really hoping that he would share his experience about herpes and stuff like this. I've been wanting to talk to him about this for a little while. Like, when they first started that group, I went in there, and I was seeing a lot of this stuff, and I was saying, okay, so if we're not going to have any rules or standards or something like that, then there needs to be some kind of social pressure. There needs to be some kind of, like, feedback system or something like that. Like, if the leaders of the group aren't going to take responsibility, then the people in the group need to take responsibility. But they were just like not having it at all like they pretty much like ran me out of that group i think it's kind of huffed up but like a lot of times what you see is like whenever a person wants to make standards or come up with rules or stuff like this it's always insinuated that there's something wrong with them as a person right they're like too authoritarian or like too much of like a, a cop too much of a control freak or some shit like this and i get i get really tired of that stuff like if we, if we care about this community, if we care about the idea that Integral can do good things in the world and like wanting to actually make this a community that's open to everyone, a movement that actually like makes a difference, we need to have standards. We need to have structure. We need to have leaders. And like, it can't just be so hands off and like everything, anything goes and all this kind of stuff. So I find this really frustrating. It's, it's something that I've seen in like tons of the Integral groups is just the leaders are so hands off with everything. And it's really like, they're more interested in the idea of maintaining talking about things endlessly than they are in really about actually doing anything good in the world. Yeah. I'm not really sure what they're interested in, honestly. I mean, they're 
a group can serve a couple of different purposes, right? A group can be, so all the members get together and just talk about their own stuff, or a group could have maybe a purpose where it tries to convince other people of something. And I'm not really sure what, which one of those, I mean, the integral group probably leans towards just wanting to be a bunch of people talking about their own stuff rather than reaching out and convincing anyone of anything. But, but sometimes I'm not so sure. If they're trying well, to reach out and convince anyone of everything, they're not, of anything, they're not really doing a great job of it. <laughs> well, I would think that maybe the groups are more about like a we space kind of thing as opposed to trying to convince people but trying to make people feel like hey this is my community like this is people uh, this is a group of like-minded people who i can discuss things with and i can feel a part of this and i can feel connected to people who actually understand me the main thing that i hear from people who are at an integral stage especially early integral like finding their way into the community is like so many of these people are closeted they're so used to translating everything to everyone that they meet that when they finally meet a group of people who understand where they're coming from. And that's super important stuff to feel seen and valued. And a lot of us are black sheep. We're the ones in our family who aren't religious or have such a nuanced perspective that like, we just feel like most people don't understand us. So I think it's like super important for us to be able to have this kind of we space with other integralists. And that's why it's like such a problem when ladies and people of color don't feel welcome in these spaces because this is supposed to be their community. This is supposed to be their homecoming. And instead, it's it's like a first-tier food fight. It's bullshit. Yeah, I know. It, it is a lot of times it's a first-tier food fight. I mean, and a lot of people aren't really actually interested in growth either. Like, I always come at, in the situation thinking I'm gonna, I could learn something from this person. You know, a lot of people walk in just saying, well, I'm integral because I heard one talk on integral, and it sounded like something I would do. You know what I mean? <laughs> so... I'm just going to label myself integral and go forward. Like it, it's odd, you know, it's just, it's just tough. It's a tough community. And you're right. A lot of us don't have a lot of people we can talk about, you know, a four quadrant view of things. And most of the people you talk to want you to have a dogmatic view of this or that. And they want to pigeonhole you. And I felt that a lot of that in my life. And, you know, it wasn't until I found integral, I really had a framework to say, okay, I'm thinking this way about this thing. And that's why I'm having conflict. I mean, I think it could really change a lot, reduce a lot of different conflicts in the world when people understand the stages and how they're getting there, you know? For sure. To go back to your idea, David, about this line of how identity and race relate to each other. I'm curious what that looks like for different ethnicities. You know what I mean? Like if there's comparable stages that let's say like a white person would go through in relation to race and identity as, as a black person and, you know, and how that translates across ethnicities and how those different distinctions that you're talking about, like, cause you said like after like the more post-ethnic type things that you could go in different directions. Yes, exactly. And I'm wondering if those are still kind of, stages of unfolding of it as well or if because i mean you know you can stop at any level and be like well i guess this is my thing but i'm wondering yeah. if different ones of those correlate to to different stages and if you see certain ones of those post-ethnic perspectives as being more mature than others or what what's your opinion on that is well there are ethnic identity development theories for asians hispanics and there's white identity development but i've only read up on dr cross and and black identity development also called nigrazants Negrizance is a Creole, <laughs> it's, it's what it's called, Negrizance, Negrizance. and it's um, a Creole world that means black and emerging. It's a, it's a French word. Am you I know? allowed to say that word, David? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's what we do uh, in, in ethnic identity development. I feel like it's a really interesting theory. And there are, there are white identity development and Asian and Hispanic. I, I know for a fact that they're there and there are theorists that did that. I have a question on that. Are you referring to, when you say black, are you referring to people who are born and raised in the United States? I mean, I, I lived in college for a year with a, a roommate who was Ethiopian. I mean, I don't mean like he came over on a slave ship in the 1600s Ethiopian. I mean, like for Christmas break, he went home to Ethiopia. And in May, he went home to Ethiopia. He was Ethiopian. And, and he, he did not have the same kind of psyche uh, that I could detect. Like he, when he walked around, he walked around like he came from somewhere where you know, he was the dominant sociological unit. Yeah, exactly. So that's a, that's a big be debate in ethnic identity development right there. The Doesn't original, have that Du Bois double consciousness type thing, yeah, I guess is what you're exactly, saying. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. That's a big de debate in ethnic identity development right now, the differences between Africans and African Americans. And so some theorists think that it's just African and other theorists think there is a difference between African American and African. That's a debate we're currently having. I come from the perspective there is African and also African American. And it is a separate sociological group that has its own history, because that's true. That is what it is. And so there are other people that don't see it that way, though. So that's, that's actually one of the best questions you could ask, because we're still trying to answer it. Hmm. 
thank you, growing up around black people here and then, and then living with an African from Africa. It was, it was definitely interesting. Yeah, yeah. And he probably is from a wealthier family because most recent okay. immigrants that come here, they come as uh, people with already, that already have money. They come here specifically to start a business or to go to school. It. So, it, yeah, so if he has money and stuff and he's looking at all these poor people, he just sees us as poor people. And so the same issue that you have with rich white people and poor white people, he's going to have with us. So same blue yeah. class. I, want, I wonder, like, I think, you know, a lot of integralists think that the problem with identity politics is that it distracts us from some of the things that we have in common, like the more like class divide stuff, like the rich versus poor kind of stuff. It's like divide and conquer. And if we all only focus on our own individual, like special needs group or something like that, in the end, we're all going to continue to get exploited and manipulated and the, the game just continues. What do you think about that? I mean, I think there's some level of truth to that. Lama Rod Owens, he talks about those two, the relative truth and the universal truth. You know, the relative truth is that I'm black, and the other people are white, and there's a conflict. And the universal truth is that we're all one human race. And you really have to hold both of those in balance because if you get pulled over, you might not be able to explain how, you know, you're at a higher consciousness level and we're all at the same spirit and stuff. You might not be able to explain all that to the cops. So... You have to hold both at the same time. And I think that if people understand how people grow in their ethnicity and their identity, I think people will be less intimidated by different people from different identities. They wouldn't have to whitewash ourselves so much to make ourselves sanitized, you know? So I think it's yeah. important that we really start speaking out from how we actually see the world and start talking more honestly. Because I think if we talk more honestly to each other, I think we'll be able to move forward and, you know, we'll help each other out. I think it's really good, the idea, too, of smarter people from different races or traditions being critical of their own groups and traditions and stuff like that. And to be able to organize, like you're saying, to like, I think it would be probably helpful for a lot of black people to know these yeah. levels of identification and the different people who are coming from different levels in terms of their theories and where they're coming from. The good thing about that is maybe you can point people towards more mature perspectives and more mature views and, and also tell them how the things that they're thinking at this level are true and valid and like there's good points to be had there as well in the same way we would engage with other people up and down the spiral it seems to me that like this line that you're talking about about ethnic identity is a super important part that we should all have in our understanding about the spiral and stuff like this so i really hope that you can crystallize some of this right. ethnic th line theory and mm -hmm. and bring it back to integral and include it in the map because i think it's super valuable and it's really good work that you're doing man thanks thanks i'm, I'm trying to do it you know and you know, I think it's really important that, that we have these cross-cultural talks, you know, because I don't want to always have to feel like I got to be separate. The next generation after me, I don't want them to feel like they got to do their own thing, you know. And so I right. think it's really important. I'm doing the same thing you're doing in terms of like pushing off and being like, okay, I'm starting my own thing. Like this is yeah. fucked up. We're doing it. We're going to have to do it better. We're going to have to do it right. And so, yeah, I hope that too. I hope that in the future, after we get done with our work, that this stuff won't be problems anymore and that people won't have to feel like they need to start their own group to actually get justice or to be seen and stuff like this. Hopefully we can fix these problems. Yep. Before we go, can you list off some black thinkers who you think that integralists should know about? Well, I think the single most important for an integralist to know about is Malcolm X because Malcolm X actually went through all the stages from red to green. So he started off as a gangster in red. His conflict that made him go to blue was going to jail. And when he was in jail, he met a man from the Nation of Islam. He went into blue. And he went through all, all the textbook stuff in blue he went through. He says that the first time he met Elijah Muhammad, he started crying because he felt he wasn't worthy enough to be in Elijah Muhammad's presence. And that was like the most blooming thing, you know, I could hear someone doing. And then he ran up against the allegations of Elijah Muhammad allegedly sleeping with underage girls. And that caused him to question his whole tradition. And that's when he started breaking off on his own and going to Mecca. And when he went to Mecca, the conflict he had there, he saw white Muslims. And when he saw white Muslims, he was like, okay, so white people can be part of my community and it doesn't have to be a conflict. And that's when he went to green. And so I think Malcolm X's life, if you study one person, it'll take you through all the spiral dynamics in that one person. So yeah, Malcolm X- That's he, great. Yeah. This is very similar to when we talked about hip hop and we talked about Snoop Dogg and yeah. him moving through the different stages as a good example of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very true. You know, he had his blue meme and his orange meme and then the green with the Rastafarian. And it's a beautiful thing. And, it, and it's very important to understand how people grow. And I think that helps with conflict because what happens is you see that, okay, I might not agree with you right now, but right. if we keep working together, we both will grow and we'll see ourselves coming together like King and then Malcolm X towards the end, they started coming together. But, you know, Malcolm X got shot so quick that 
you know, that conflict they were having at the beginning became less and less of a conflict as they both grew. And I think that's another a sign of moving up in spiral dynamics. So people that you disagree with, if y'all are both moving forward, you'll end up starting to agree more. And I think that's another sign you're moving up in the spiral. Yeah. What do you think about Brother West, Cornell West? Yeah, I really like I mean, that guy. Definitely, definitely an integral, integral thinker. Definitely a higher order green, borderlining or an integral, a very astute person, very well read and everything. And he's just, you know, Brother, Brother West, he, he really amazes me. That's what some person I could just sit and listen to for hours on end and not be bothered. Yeah. Not, you know, not only does he have a beautiful mind, but his style and like yeah. the way he delivers, man, like, oh, it's beautiful. It is. Who else do you like? I've been studying um, ben Ramo, Dr. Ben Ramo and Becker from India. He was a Dalit, an untouchable. And he worked in, to write the Indian Constitution. And he actually made a reservation program for other Dalits to where there's a certain, it's like Indian affirmative action. He was also right. a Buddhist and he wrote uh, extensive histories on Buddha. And so I've been working on him for a couple of years now. And we'll do a video series on Ann Becker to explain all the different aspects of his thought and why I think he should be somebody considered an integral. A. Philip Randolph was a very healthy orange. I think it's important not to just say, I only want to listen to integral thinkers because it's good to have your healthy orange on point, your healthy green, your healthy blue. A. Philip Randolph, he started the Coleman Porters Union back in the 1940s. And it was the first black union to be in the AFL-CIO. And he's a great political mind. He actually got a lot done before King from a black perspective, someone without a lot of power and money. So I think he's somebody, if you're trying to make political change, without having a lot of power and money, I think A. Philip Randolph is the guy you need to model yourself after. Nice. Yeah, so those are just a couple of people. I have the list on my website, Black Leadership Analysis. I figure people will go through it themselves and decide which leaders they want to model themselves after. Because there might be people that I don't particularly like that other people love, so. Word. Yeah, well maybe we can share that list in the description as well. Sure thing. Did y'all get a chance to check out any of those integral life talks about racism that they did recently? I watched one of them with Greg Thomas. I wasn't really expecting a lot, and it wasn't memorable enough for me to start commenting on it. I mean, like I said, the Corey Davos guy, I mean, I really don't want to hear him talk about racism after I know he, like, you know. Gives uh, a pass like, to him. Yeah, gives yeah. a pass to the Nazis, so I didn't really care what he had to say. I mean, Greg Thomas actually have correspondence. We talked over email, and our email conversations are pretty good, but uh, I haven't got around to watching them. I've been really doing more research than listen to other integral stuff because I don't feel like I, I just didn't I wasn't really interested I guess Word. I, I need to get uh, get on the bed now I gotta wrap up now. all right man all right I'll well, see you. I love, for, you. love uh, you too buddy uh -huh. have a wonderful evening thanks so much for your contribution man thank you thank you nice to meet you yeah yeah so that was that was a pretty good talk did you enjoy it man yeah yeah it was a pretty good time I learned a lot me too. I really like David Hartful. That guy is like, he's so knowledgeable about history and very studious when it comes to history and race and all this kind of stuff. I mean it, I'm, I mean it when I'm saying that I'm really sad that he feels the need to not include himself in the integral community due to the way that they behave. That's heartbreaking, honestly, because I think he has so much to, uh, so much to give. Yeah, man. He, that guy should be celebrated in our community, not feeling uncomfortable or unwelcome. That's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's, that's rough. I don't like that at all. Um, yeah. You know, it, I mean, he obviously feels safe enough in your area, in your in your Facebook group, so that's good. So maybe we can continue to learn from him there, I hope. But I think the integral movement is, um, I think probably there's just too many different kinds of people in it, and no one really agrees on what kind of people belong to the integral movement. So you get yeah. a giant mixture in there of, you know, woo-woo, witchy-poo people, and then you get the PhD psychologist types that are swearing that Ken Wilber's not their guru, but maybe they act like he is. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and you get, cult members. You get, cult members. You get everyone in between, too. And, and then yeah. your occasional Nazi one-off here and there. And you can't judge people to, in, in, in an efficient way to let them in to the group or not. So you're always going to have that gating issue. And yeah. uh, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, I think you do a pretty good job in your friends and family group. I mean, we haven't had too many issues there. I think you do a pretty good job there, but, um, Thanks, but man. you really, you really seem to vet them at least to a point. You know? Yeah. I draw, I draw hard lines in the sand. I actually, I think making it more explicit and having like a, a 2.0 and like drawing the line in the sand and like allowing for some of these arguments and like saying over here, we're going to have debates. And if you want to establish something, you're going to have to prove it. You're going to have to stand by those ideas and defend mm -hmm. them. And we're going to do it explicitly figuring out these new ways of building together not just talking in circles endlessly forever, but figuring out how we can build together. I think that's gonna yeah. be really important. Thanks everybody for watching and joining us. Big thanks to my guests today, Josh, David, and Blake. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Support me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time. Peace.